Welcome back to another edition of the Friday Golf Podcast. I am your host, Andy Johnson, and I am joined by fellow co-hosts, Garrett Morrison and Joseph Lamagna. This is going to be a fun episode. We're, uh, you know, we're, we're in the election spirit here. We did a podcast about a serious podcast about what the election might mean for pro golf last week. This week, we're going to do a little bit more uh, silly front end here. We're going to be each running for president of golf. And we're gonna, we've got five campaign topics that we're going to talk about. Um, Garrett, uh, Joseph, and myself, I guess we're gonna, we could come up with our party titles. We can see who's been influenced by big equipment, you know, based off their campaign uh, campaign uh, 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 preferences and 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 sides they choose here. Um, but we're gonna run for for president of golf. You guys can be the judge of who who wins the this debate. Um, and we've come up with a couple topics, and then we will kick it over to an interview I did with Rue McDonald. Um, who is with the DP World Tour? Used to host a uh, a, go- a podcast about Scot- Scottish golf. Who came on to talk about the critical juncture in the Cool Links story, which is a potential golf development uh, just north of Royal Dornoch in Scotland, um, which has uh, a, a a some important moments in its uh, potential development coming up. So we we'll kick it over to that on the back end of this episode. But welcome on, Joseph and Garrett. I I am I'm ex- extremely excited to to share this debate uh, platform with you guys. Well, my question is, if we become president, will there be any checks and balances on us? <laughs> no, no checks and balances. So we're really running for king, <laughs> king. of golf. <laughs> yes, king of golf. <laughs> no, no, no democratic system here. Well, it all depends on who you get in bed with. If you get in bed with, uh, you know, with big equipment or big agronomy, mm. we'll see. We'll see. You know, here are the things. Things are you could be elected like you could run on something. You could be truly political and waver in the wind and, uh, you know, and know that you'll garner votes if you say, let's let drivers go 500 yards. You know, <laughs> well, I could just say a bunch of completely unrealistic stuff, get elected and then just sell out to the highest bidder immediately. Yes. Yes. These that are has all... never happened in, in the United States, by the way. This is this is completely imaginary here. N- nothing of the sort would happen in our country. No, nothing, nothing. This the all all in all, this could be, you know, it could, it could be a week where, you know, people are are stressed out about the election. This is supposed to be all in fun and good fun and spirits. So we have uh we have five topics. We have men's pro golf, women's pro golf. I'm going to throw a curveball and throw in amateur golf here. Oh. Because I'm going to add one because it doesn't seem right to just address the pro golf game. Um, amateur golf, grow the game initiative. You have We have tasked everybody to come up with one grow the game initiative. Equipment and uh, golf course industry. Those are the big topics. We'll we'll debate and and propose our our uh, thoughts on each topic, and then uh, maybe we'll have PJ declare a winner at the end. PJ is the one voter. <laughs> the one voter. <laughs> <laughs> He's so PJ really has all the power here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's By the way, P- PJ, unlike on the Shotgun Start podcast, PJ is in the silent booth right now in our uh, recording system. And yeah. so, so he he can't say anything, but he gets to vote. Yes, yes. He's in full producer mode, which yeah. does not give him any speaking privileges. <laughs> Before we get to talking about our campaigns here, Let's talk about Good Walk Coffee Company. Uh, we are partners with Good Walk Coffee. Uh, we make great coffee together. Um, they are our roaster. Um, they buy high grade beans from all around the world, and they uh, they make great coffee with them. So we have a couple different blends. A personal anecdote is I gave one of my neighbors 
a cup of cup coffee one morning. She, uh, they, they are, they buy good beans. And, uh, this is a true story. I gave her a cup of coffee and she said, what was that coffee you gave me? It was so good. I said, well, here's, here's a little bit, uh, here's a bag that is half full. Try it out. It's my, it's our coffee that we make. She is now a subscriber to the coffee. So turned her into a subscriber. She was a subscriber of coffee of a very good, uh, Bay Area roast com- roastery company. So if you want to become a fried egg coffee subscriber or try out fried egg coffee, um, check us out at goodwalkcoffee.com slash fried egg. We have two blends. We have the fried egg blend. Um, this one I would recommend to people that like a lighter roast. And then we have the shotgun start blend, which I would recommend to people that like their roast a little bit darker. So if you go to goodwalkcoffee.com slash fried egg and use the promo code fried egg at checkout, you'll get 20% off your entire order. Um, if you want to start a coffee subscription, you get 30% off your first order and then you'll save 10% on all future shipments. Uh, that's goodwalkcoffee.com slash fried egg. And the promo code is fried egg, one word. Thanks. Let's get to our presidential campaigns here. Um, all right, so let's kick it off. Let's kick it off with the uh, the first topic. We'll start with men's professional golf. Joseph Lamagna, you are up first. The the way we're talking about this, I kind of wish I, I may have, may have taken this exercise too seriously and probably should have pandered well, a lot more. There's time time to switch. I, I know I, I might. I have nothing well, written down. I'm I'm speaking third on that, every topic. Now and that, now that we know how voting's done, we know who to pander to. <laughs> exactly. Pander this to is, PJ. We're all the variables like, have changed. Champions Tour <laughs> affordable on public week. courses on Long Island. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, my. The New York Jets platform. and Mets tie up. <laughs> That's right. Save the New York Jets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, make, make, make the Yankees trade Juan Soto to the Mets. <laughs> I'm going to have to change some things on the fly here. Um, my men's professional golf platform, Jay Monahan's getting fired, but that's not the main thing I'm sticking to. Completely, we're doing away with TIO relief. No TIO relief in any... You, if it rubs up against a concession stand if your ball goes up a concession stand you can have a one-shot penalty but otherwise it is on course set up there's oh, no more sick. tio relief no more cart path relief players are going to have an absolute uprising but pj is going to love it which is the most important contingency <laughs> here and there's the only one sport right now that is actively compromising the field or the court you don't have cameras getting in the way on an nba court interrupting shots we're doing away with tio relief completely let's restore some consequence back to professional golf. I like that one. You know, I, I shouldn't say that because I'm you running could, against you. You but. could take unplayables. You could yeah. like you, if you yeah. don't like what you, the only, your only option is to take an unplayable. Yes. And one of the options of unplayable, which rarely gets used is replaying your last shot. Absolutely. Which would be and it's a sick. player, player run organization, the PJ tour. If they don't like it, then talk to the PJ tour setup crew and move the infrastructure around, but no more TIO. Yeah. Lots of potential tin cup situations there. Oh, yeah. if, we, if we get, if we, if somebody reunites the game and you get Patrick Reed there, he could start to say that all the, all the TI, all the obstructions are on the left side of the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> and people are, people are, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they the players have banded together against me every obstruction is on the left side of the golf course yeah patrick reed does not like things on the left all right my proposal <laughs> for my platform with regard to men's pro golf is to abolish the fedex cup playoffs get rid of them we are destroying the fedex cup playoffs and we're not looking back we're going to focus on establishing strong, distinct tournament brands. Make the Tour Championship what it should be, one of the three best non-majors on the PGA Tour schedule. You can keep it at Eastlake. Eastlake's fine. It seems like it has a lot of support there. But make it the Tour Championship, not this weird staggered start thing that we have right now. And then 
and this is really appealing to Andy rather than PJ, so I should probably change this, but bring back the Western Open. <laughs> <laughs> make, it, make it a rotation between Olympia Fields, Harding Park, Chambers Bay, Cherry Hills maybe, or, or Castle Pines would probably be the most likely candidate in Denver. But Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, Denver, three great cities that are underserved by PGA Tour Golf right now. That is With the good BMW venues. Western Open. You can keep the sponsor. You know, you could have some nice BMW ads with with golfers driving across the desert or the Great Plains or whatever to get wherever they're going. It seems like an obvious sort of partnership between a brand and a concept for a tournament. That's my proposal. Focus on creating great tournaments on the PGA Tour schedule. Abandon these notions that you're ever going to generate an enthusiasm about a season long race on the PGA tour. I just don't think it's going to happen. This is not F one. So make those tournaments great. What's valuable in golf is an awesome tournament like the masters or the U S open or the open. That's what we should be focusing on. I like the idea of incentivizing each individual tournament to be great on itself. Like the idea yeah. of, Oh, nobody's coming to our event. Well, maybe your event sucks. That's why yeah. nobody's coming. Everybody, so everybody wants to go to better. the Masters. It's not like that came from nowhere. It's yeah, it's an awesome tournament at an awesome course. So it's like, oh, <clears throat> players aren't coming. That's not the PGA Tour's fault. That's your fault. If you put the onus back on that, like you would get fresh ideas. You would get events doing creative stuff to to entice players to come. You might get new formats. You might, you know, like it, there's a way, but you know, the way the PGA tour is going, what I like about this, <laughs> both, the, both of the discussed options seem to be the opposite of the way that the tour is running. Yeah. You know, they're trying to get every tournament run by a championship management, which is the, basically the death to any soul of, of an event. If yeah. you want to, if you want to kill the soul of an event, Turn it over to championship management. Is that I your mean, platform? It just goes against <laughs> abolish champions um, management. So one thought, one thought. I was, I was. There was, uh, there was a large contingent of people, um, a big collect cohort of uh, of of funding sources that was trying to say, was trying to convince me to just say, just end men's pro golf, just end it. <laughs> But I, I said Are no. Are these the anarchists? I, I said no to that money. <laughs> Instead, I am uh, I'm going to run on the platform of everybody saying make pro golf smaller, make it a you know like make the the top end of the tour really small. I'm going to say just make it really big. Have a thousand uh, have a thousand person tour. Just put the the European tour, the PGA tour, Live Golf, Corn Ferry tour, the Challenge tour, TGL. and PGA Tour Americas. All uh, it call it the same tour, but have different levels and exempt statuses that you cycle up and down. You play for the same points, and it's one giant tour that feeds up and down constantly. There's no relegation event. There's relegation events every single week. You're either up, you're either down. If you fall out of the top 50, you're out. You know, oh, it, 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 we're, we're playing a tournament in November. If I'm 45th, I don't get an off season. I got to go play. I got to go grind to keep my status up high. And I think like, actually, like everybody's like, Ben, I, this was just a thought this morning. Everybody's been talking about making pro golf smaller. And when you think about the idea of pro golf, like and you think about it, it makes sense off the off the uh, off the bat. Yeah, we need a smaller tour. But in reality, most things in golf are completely the opposite of what you think. You know, if you're if you're hitting the ball right, you know, if you're hitting a slice, you swing right. You don't swing left. Like you naturally you think, "Oh, I need to swing left." You know, everything in golf is actually the opposite of what you nat your natural instinct is to think. So my my platform is going to be make a giant tour and have just playing up and playing down all the time. 
would that be the theme of your administration? Just do the opposite of whatever, whatever the common sense approach would be. I think there is like with golf, there is a strong, um, if you did the opposite of what the general public thinks you should do with golf, you would generally be on the right side of history. Andy, have you run this idea of one giant tour by the department of justice? I have not. I've not. Well, which department of justice? True, true. <laughs> if I'm if I'm the king, I don't have to worry about this right. department of okay, justice. Fair you're enough, you're, you're <laughs> dismantling the department of justice. You're you're staffing it with uh with cronies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this right. is uh, Andy's project 2025. Let's move on. I'm going to I'm going to pause on the Whitman's golf. I'm going to throw a wrench. I'm going to I'm going to misdirect go in different order. Garrett, what's your grow the game initiative? My grow the game initiative is to establish a registry of public courses that are historically and or architecturally important and create grants for restoration projects at these courses. Do I know where the money's coming from? No, but since I'm the king, I can just kind of <laughs> appropriate a, a certain portion of the, of the uh, tax funds that, uh, that come in and, and uh, that'll, that'll be that. But You could tax pro golfers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> they love being taxed. <laughs> um, <laughs> so create these grants for restoration projects, maybe establish a panel or something like that of independent history and architecture experts who could determine which courses qualify for these grants, but provide these courses some money to do legitimate restoration work. And I believe that that would help grow the game I don't know. It would make the game better. I don't really like growing <laughs> the idea of growing the game because usually when people say that, they just mean I want more money from the game. But uh, I believe this would be good for the game in the sense that one thing we need right now is a greater supply of golf courses. And one place where we can find that is struggling historic courses in urban centers. Right now, those courses are closing down rather than you know, getting to the next level because it's so hard to make the finances work. But the demand is there right now for golf. We need, if anything, more golf courses right now. We are undersupplied with public golf courses. The public golf courses that we have, especially in urban areas, are booked up to the gills. People can't find tee times. And so we need to preserve the great golf courses that we have in city centers, historic golf courses that have been there for a long time, but just need a little bit of TLC. And that's what this registry and grant system would do. It's almost like uh, farmer subsidies. Yeah, right. Yeah. Grow some corn, <laughs> you know, grow some good architecture. We know, we know it's not, not, you could make more money growing something else, but grow us corn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We need corn. We, we know need you, good we golden know age you, architecture. We know you can sell your golf course to private equity and turn it private. We or or turn it into a mixed use uh, <laughs> residential development. Not to make this too serious right now, but I just heard recently that a great old course in the Philadelphia area, I believe, J.C. Melrose. Yeah. Do you know about this place? Yeah. Maxwell, the Maxwell course. It's closing down. I saw that. It's done. It's being redeveloped. And the fact that that is happening right now when there's so much demand for golf is a problem. And it's something that we need to address urgently or else the game is going to wither on the vine. We need a supply of golf courses and we need a financial system that that allows those golf courses to exist. And be affordable and be affordable and be good. Joseph, what's your grow the game initiative? Uh, not too dissimilar. Garrett, I like your idea. I want to reimagine the way that public golf courses are booked. It's a problem specifically in Austin where I live, but I think it's a problem. Huge problem throughout. in LA too. Yeah. Yeah. The there LA was a no laying up site. podcast about this, uh, about LA specifically recently, um, put together by Kevin Van Valkenburg. Yeah. yeah. So like you're saying, Garrett, there is high demand right now and often not enough supply. At certain golf courses, like the way it works in Austin, people have to line up at certain hours to get a tee time, which really only allows certain people, like a lot of retirees, to get those tee times. I think there should be 
a solution where people who want to play golf have some level of access. It might not be like a, a perfect priority order where everyone's getting an equal booking time, but I think there, we could do a little bit. We can make some strides on getting people who are interested in playing golf out onto the golf course. I'm interested in looking at dynamic pricing. I think it's sometimes crazy how tee times that are $60 all the time go unused and then nobody's using them when they could pay, I don't know, $24, $28. I know that there's some pushback on dynamic pricing, but I want to explore it. I'm going to take solutions. We're, we're going to solicit solutions from the smartest minds. I don't have a full plan to lay out here, but I want to completely reimagine the way that public golf is booked in, in this country and potentially in the world. If this solution works, we'll take it worldwide. I like this. You know, we're Joseph is uh, proposing some some capitalist um, uh, ideas, some you know free market speech from Joseph here for for public golf, and then, and then and, saying that he's going to spread it worldwide. <laughs> I haven't heard this global, before. The idea of, of spreading democracy worldwide. It's, it's, I'm not like talking about idea. spreading democracy. Oh, I mean, we, on, we should, we should pursue this, and if it if they don't accept it, then we should go to war with them. <laughs> This is, you, I'm, this is being misconstrued. I just didn't want to leave out all of our friends across the globe who get mad when we're too American-centric. I wanted to offer the solution. I'm agreeing Meanwhile, with Garrett, you, Joseph. Garrett's, on, Garrett's talking about subsidies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm all about program, big government, government, clearly. Program yeah. I'm, I'm going to grow the government so much. I'm not growing the game. I'm growing the government. All right. I uh, I guess my... my what I want to propose for grow the game, I think kids clubs should be free. Here's the thing. Kids clubs are good for like a year. Your kid grows all the time. So you go into the golf shop, you, you sign out a set, and then you bring it back a year later and you get the new set. There's yeah. no reason that people should have to pay, pay to get these golf clubs. Like, this is you a should, good one. Yeah. So it should be free because like you by the time you buy them and you out you outgrow them in like a, a, a year or two. So make these golf sets like you, you go in, you sign out. If you don't bring it back, you don't get the next size up. Um, And yeah, sure. Like, is this going to cost a little bit of money? Absolutely. But this is a way to actually get golf clubs in people's hands. Like, have you have you tried? Has your kid tried golf? Oh, no, I heard it's super expensive. Well, actually. Kids get free clubs if they go and they you can go pick them up here. Like there's nothing special about kids clothes. You are kids clubs. You don't need like big time tech in them. You don't need a anything like that. And the thing about it is like there's great programs like Youth on Course that offer affordable golf for kids. Why don't we make the golf clubs really affordable and easy to use too? This is like one of the great virtues of basketball is that Literally, the only thing you need to play basketball is a basketball. Yeah, or soccer. And there are hoops all over the place. Soccer, yeah. the most popular games uh, in terms of participation, generally are the easiest ones to play. So let's remove some of the barriers for kids playing these sports. Let's give them free golf clubs. I love that. You, you know, your daughter's not old enough right now, I think, to have golf clubs yet. Maybe you're already starting her. Like I have. The, I, like have the I have a set. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, we haven't used them. My kids are my kids are are uh, seven and ten, and so they are both have sets of golf clubs, and it has been expensive to keep them in golf clubs that actually fit them, because as you say, they grow quickly, and also when you buy them a set of golf clubs, you're thinking, well, I got to get it too big for them right now because they need to grow into it like a pair of shoes, and. That's a problem, too, because for six months or whatever, they're they're using golf clubs that are kind of way too, way too big from, uh, for them. But I do like how we're working the deficit here. We are really yes. milking that. De we're, we're, we're just, just living on the edge of, of that huge <laughs> deficit and and just, uh, you know, living there. Um, well, so we're going to get we're going to get there by taxing the pro golfers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> the real solution here is make the usga do it <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's the uh that's good the thing, real good thing mechanism this podcast that we would use. isn't sponsored by the usga <laughs> um all right let's move on to the next topic we're gonna go with equipment 
I think we're all going to have the same proposal here. Well, I don't know. I might waver in the wind. This is where I might be appealing to. (laughs) You might take some uh, of that accushionate money. Sweet, sweet. Exactly. Well, you want to know how you could pay for the free golf clubs? You know, you buddy up with the cushionette. <laughs> the pack of cushionette. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we'll start with you, Joseph, on this topic. I'm I'm just realizing as you suggested free kids clubs, I, I thought way too inside the box for all. My solutions are way too practical. So I'm kind of regretting that. I'm going to have to change on the fly for no, future ones. No, it's good to be practical. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this PJ, was, this PJ was always seems like a practical person. Yeah. PJ was sketching out his uh, Champions Tour trip and sending yeah. me hard costs. He's PJ, a practical guy. He's a pragmatist. Fair enough. All right. I'm just shrinking the driver head, keeping it simple. I don't need to t- dwell on this one too long. We've heard a million golfers it- talk about it, de-skilling the game. We're shrinking the driver head effective immediately. Let's bring some finding the center of the club face back to professional golf. This is only going to be for professional golfers. If you want to swing a 10,000 CC club head, because that's what everyone loves, be my guest. But uh, this is going to help rein in distance. It's a very practical solution. Bring back skill, address the distance issue. We're shrinking the driver head on day one. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my proposal as well. But instead of saying that, I'll just say two words. No tease. Next question. Um, <laughs> my, my proposal is a driver that, that <laughs> explodes when you, <laughs> when you swing over a certain miles per hour as the great Peter Costas. Was. Peter Costas. Or, or maybe like a piece of it falls off or something or, you know, whatever. I, I'm just going to propose this because, it's, you know, this is, this is all fun. This might not be the most practical thing. One of the great things about persimmon heads was that you had like people like pro golfers would use the same driver for 20 years. So, again, in the nature of like removing barriers to entry into the sport, like cost is one of the biggest ones. And when you had the best players in the world using a 20 year old driver or 10 year old driver, that's a good message. That means you don't have to go spend $800 or $1,000 every year to get the new tech. So my, my proposal, let's go back to persimmon. Have there be modest, you know, innovation. You could, you like, I remember I have a, I have a set of uh, Ben Hogan woods that I shipped away to Roberto Castro that had like this little cut in the side of the head that was like a speed slot, you know, that like the idea was to increase the aerodynamics, but like persimmon, like you can't hollow out persimmon. You can't like, it's just a solid block of wood. And the thing about it is like, once you find a driver you like, you just use it. That's your driver. And, and I think that's fine. Like that's kind of the way I treat drivers in general is once I find a driver, I like, I usually use it until it cracks. And then I move on to the next one. The great thing about persimmon is that it won't crack in six years or seven years. It'll it will just be good for twenty five years. I'd never have to buy a new driver. So go back to to persimmon heads for woods, and you would immediately reduce the cost of the sport. Like once again, like my platform is like, how do we increase participation and reduce the cost of the game, really in general, and uh, and and. That's where I'm going to be on persimmon driver heads. And guess what? It's more fun to hit a persimmon driver head. I can't tell you how many times I go places with either my hickories or my retro clubs and say we play through a group or a group plays through us, whatever it may be. Everybody in the group's like, oh, my God, is that a persimmon driver? Is that a hickory driver? And I say, oh, do you want to try and hit it? And they're like, oh, absolutely. And then they hear the sound of it and they're like, oh, my God, that was amazing. It was way easier to hit than I thought it was. People, I think like one of the things that the that the equipment companies have done, and this is where I'm going to lose my my Kushnet funding um, for the free kids clubs. <laughs> I think they've hoodwinked people into thinking that persimmons are like this impossible thing to hit. Well, the the crazy thing is that you and I, Andy, are old enough to remember watching people play persimmon drivers for real yeah like when i started like playing golf handicaps. my dad still hit a persimmon driver my dad is not a professional golfer 
he just liked the club and he had fun playing golf. I dare say he had more fun playing golf than most people who play golf today. And so the game was fun 40, 50 years ago. It's just expectations that have gotten in the way. And you know what's cool is watching Shohei Otani swing a wooden bat. It just That's wouldn't right. be as cool to see him do what he does with a metal bat. And sorry for bringing up traumatic things, uh, PJ. Probably the underrated part of that, too, is the impact it could have on pace of play. By mm-hmm. hitting the ball a little bit shorter, not everyone going for 500 yard, 520 yard par fives at public golf courses, like we'd probably see an increase in pace of play. The other thing is dispersion patterns are are less because the ball doesn't go as far. So it doesn't go as far offline. Less time looking for golf balls. Something that's already gotten lost in the equipment discussion is the whole point in the first place, which was to try to control the expanding footprint of everyday golf courses. That's what the governing bodies were really putting research into was finding out what those dynamics were not just at tour golf courses, but at the golf courses we play every day. And they did find that those courses are being stressed by the realities of of distance gains at every level of the game. So this is not just a professional golf issue. But we're agreeing too much here. I, I feel like people don't have enough of a reason, or PJ doesn't well, have enough so of a reason to vote We for haven't it. swerved off yet. Yeah. We haven't nobody's nobody's made a, a you know crazy claim that you know clearly some sort of big industry titan has gotten to him i mean i did say no tease i'm not sure which industry would encourage that (laughs) just i think you're pandering to to random twitter responders that (laughs) always suggest that i am that's that's (laughs) such a twitter thing to say no (laughs) tease um let's go to women's professional golf uh what is your what is your your um platform here what is your opinion where where's where do we need to go who's going go ahead, Garrett. Go ahead, Garrett. Garrett. okay i gotta go last on all of them well because... you're because you're, you, you get to you get to back clean up here yeah yeah um well with women's pro golf since since i've already established myself as a tournament destroyer in in my proposal to abolish the fedex cup playoffs let's get rid of the evian championship you know it can still exist but it's not a major and let's give an ultimatum to Chevron and say, if you don't take this tournament to a worthy golf course, we're taking away your major status too. We'll go with three majors for the time being and see if a fourth emerges somewhere along the way. But right now these are not majors. Nobody feels like they're majors. It's just a big charade. We're told they're majors, but we know in our souls that the Evian Championship and the Chevron Championship are not major championship golf in the way that the U.S. Women's Open is, in the way that the Women's PGA Championship is, and in the way that the Women's Open clearly is. So that's something that really needs to be fixed because if one thing absolutely has to work in a professional golf structure, it's the major championships. That's the one thing that men's pro golf is doing right right now. It's the one thing that's going well at, on that side of the game. The majors are still the majors and are still great. The women's game needs to get its act together with these five majors, two of which are really not majors. That's some big dictator energy right there, Garrett. That's, to say, that's hey, like, yeah. Evian, go tell Chevron what I did to you. That's <laughs> I'm just, just blitzing. Heavy-handed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, My proposal is a women's golf app that televises or broadcasts, streams all of their tournaments. No, we're going to blow up all of our existing network deals and just go straight to a streaming service that is similar to like the WNBA League Pass. And maybe we still have a couple of plus. uh, It's going to be LPGA Tour Plus. And (laughs) I don't it no longer. Are people going to have to worry about where you can watch it? If it's going to be tape delayed? I don't care if 5,000 people are watching it or 5 million, but we're going to have an app specifically dedicated for it. And if there is this infusion of fan interest into women's golf, I don't know how popular women's golf will be five years from now, but it's going to be set up and ready to capture that fan interest if it arrives. That is my platform, uh, LPGA Tour Plus. All right. I like that idea. It's, and and, I- the, and the advantage of it is that... Uh, LPGA Tour Commissioner Molly Marcus Saman can say, 
well, yes, our ratings aren't that good, but there are millions of people watching on the app. <laughs> Transparent reporting, too. Actually, could you partner with caffeine? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Revive <laughs> caffeine TV <laughs> could get some big deals in Australia and, and Spain with uh, streaming services. Um. I I am going to propose that we beef up the LPGA Tour media team. Um, I of all like there are a lot of things that I would like to address about the LPGA Tour course collection. Uh, course selection would be my sec- my secondary platform. Yeah, that I'd Ske- run on. schedule is a mess. Can you I believe would, how bad the schedule is? It's a bad <laughs> schedule, but like at the end of the day, they're showing they're they're not doing themselves any favors. Like I never go on like the, the, the Twitter or the Instagram and see like, you know, tons of great shots being played. Like, and I, and I think like a lot of this is just like resource allocation, you know, like I would be dumping money into making our sport more visible. And right now the best way to free to, you know, effectively, a cost effectively increase your visibility is through social media. And I think their social media pages are leave a lot to be desired. And I think it's probably in a lot of ways just about not having enough people. So I would maybe look at, hey, could we reallocate a hundred thousand dollars here, a hundred thousand dollars here, and maybe double our our media team um uh amount of people and the resources they have so that we can put our sport out in front of people as much as possible so we can garner viral moments like i think like a lot of probably like great moments happen on the LPGA that could be sports center top 10 moments but they just don't tell anybody that they happened that we don't we don't know what happened because like a lot of times they are never it's never show it's either shown on tape delay as joseph uh put uh, suggested or it's never clipped into social media or it never was televised in the first part. So like my big thing would be all be about visibility. Let's get our product out there as much as possible on these free, potentially viral channels in order to garner more fan interest. I could be with that. I mean, the PGA Tours media team now has its own palace, it sounds yeah. like. I wouldn't do a deal where we we rented office space in there. It's kind of like their their TV rights deal <laughs> where they get just exactly tack like on. Tack on. That could yeah. be another platform. Like let's not align ourselves with the PGA Tour. <laughs> that could be like yeah. the this another platform. We're gonna do every everything the PGA Tour is doing. We're gonna do the complete opposite, and you probably have a really good tour. Absolutely. I, I think that's the, the real opportunity for the LPGA Tour right now is to define itself in opposition to the PGA Tour. That's an open lane. And I think it could be pretty fruitful. And I think they do it to a certain extent with like the players. The players are so friendly. They're so welcoming. They're so excited about like playing golf. Like right there, you have a diametrically opposed tour, right? You right. go to a PGA Tour event whether you're a fan or a member of the media and you are, you are just lucky to be gracing the player's presence. Right. You know, like yeah. you're just lucky, lucky that you might get to see to walk past one of them. <laughs> the LPGA is like, Hey, how are you doing? And you're I, as a media member, you're like, wait, what, why are you asking me how I'm doing? It is almost a little bit confusing, <laughs> but yeah, the, the live LPGA tour experience is is fantastic. And maybe that's another thing that could be built out a little bit because Going to LPGA tour events is super fun, but I'm not sure that people talk about that that much or or that the events locally are 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 really gaining traction in the way that they should. Um, I think that I think they have just like a a messaging issue in yeah. general about their product and what it is and how it is like they just they just in general do not they I don't think they have the resources to properly expose people to what their product is. It's bizarre too, because if there's one thing that money is being spent on right now, it is women's sports. Yeah. Right. Those sponsorships should not necessarily, I'm not saying that it's as big of money as like the NFL is getting from the TV networks, obviously, but 
those sponsorships are are not that hard to come by. And for some reason, the LPGA Tour right now is shedding sponsors rather than picking up sponsors. It sounds like Cognizant is maybe out. So there's something odd going on with the leadership of the LPGA Tour. I'm not sure what it is, but it feels oddly low energy at the moment. All right. Final, final platform uh, or, you know, topic that we're going to bat around here. The golf course industry. This this includes architecture. This includes agronomy. It's just all about golf courses. Garrett's already, already crowbarred this topic into grow the game. <laughs> That's true. It might have taken my platform here, but I've, <laughs> I'm going to come up with a different one. I so might have Joseph, initially had that one for golf course industry, but not been able to come up with anything for grow the game and, and maybe moved it. Joseph, what's your your uh, initiative here? Yeah, I mine is for some central repository database. I would love to have all golf courses, but if it's just municipal golf courses, that that's fine. If it's municipal public, that's great. But I want to store all of the original drawings of a golf course with the architects, an explanation for the architect's vision for the golf course so that years down the line, we're not looking back, trying to scrape together drawings and understand if the architect who's hired to do the renovation is betraying the original vision. I want it all documented somewhere in one central source. If someone's hired to do a project on a municipal course, we're going to put what that cost and what the work was on it all in one location, remove all the ambiguity around what the architect's original intent was and what the golf course looks like 150 years later. Get that set up. It's not a day one initiative, but that's my second or third week on the job. This should be on the friday.com, it sounds like. It can be a private sector solution. <laughs> okay, my proposal. No green speeds above 11 on the stick. God, meter. you just took another one, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it, too. I knew this was going to be one of yours. <laughs> i'm sorry you know what i could have talked about like know, bunker sand or something like that is, but i know this is this is not the case in american politics but we can have a similar stance on things we can agree on things yeah that's right this is politics can be this way where we can agree on things right you can elect either of us and we'll be happy for each other <laughs> I don't know. I I won't be hatched. You won't happy. go that far. I, I will. Uh, I'll disassociate and start my own my own country within within Fried Egg. <laughs> fried Eggistan. All right. Well, it'll be the it'll be Fried Egg. Uh, you know the Jefferson of Fried Egg. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I forgot about the the state of Jefferson. Yeah, that's in my area of the country too. Yeah. That's great. Um. All right. Anyway. I found a, a great quote from Pete Dye uh, a couple of days ago for uh, and put it in this uh, design notebook uh, that we just published in Club TFE. And I thought that Pete Dye said it really well. The great architect Pete Dye, the guy behind TPC Sawgrass, Harbortown, etc. He said, if greens are maintained at speeds over 11 feet on the stint meter, no architect in their right mind can build any contour or character into their greens. When you take contour out of the greens and speed them up, you only make the game easier for the average putting tour pro and harder for the club player. There is much more skill required in putting slower, undulating, and grainy greens than there is in putting flat ones that are fast. So at some point, we are going to have to figure out what we really want from our golf courses. Do we want interesting tests of skill with lots of character and perhaps a little grain on the greens? Or do we want level but slick putting surfaces that only make the game less interesting? I think that puts it really well. By slowing down greens, you incentivize architects to do more interesting work. You incentivize clubs to maintain the character of their courses. I think like the 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 fascinating thing about this quote was is the start of it where he talks about you know how it makes it easier for the average player and harder for the good player. Yeah. You know, like that It's so that, true it, too, right? If you want a tour pro to make a bunch of putts, give them a flat, smooth, 
fast, fast green. green. They're yeah. just going to make everything from everywhere. Everything from everywhere. Meanwhile, when you slow it down, like what's the talking point at every open championship? Oh, they, they're just struggling to get the speeds right. You know why? Because they actually have to worry about the, a ball getting to the hole. They have to like the idea of a ball coming up short is a realm of possibility, right? So speed control actually becomes like a big thing. And I think like people get upset because like some people just lay it dead constantly over and over again. You know what that is? That's someone with supreme speed control being rewarded. You know, somebody that hits the center of the putter face over and over again being rewarded. We saw perhaps Scotty Scheffler's worst putting performance this year at the Open Championship. He was awful on putts of like six feet, eight feet. And one thing that popped in my mind is like, oh, he actually has to hit the putt solid for the ball to stay on the line and go in the hole. I I had one of my worst putting rounds of the year at a course uh, called Wolf River Golf Park. Um, they were perhaps the best greens that I putted on all year in terms of what we're talking about now. They were rock hard, so firm, and they rolled at about a nine, maybe a 10. And I was, when I had a wedge in my hand, I was like terrified about like thinking about like, I need to land this 92 yards. And if I land at 94, I'm probably going to miss this section of the green that I need to get this wedge into. But then when I got on the green, if I had six feet and the putt and the, and you know, a lot of the cups were on, you know, slopes, I was really, I, I was struggling that day with my stroke, was not hitting putts solidly, and I was missing everything. And I think about like that day as like, oh, I putted probably the worst I putted all year that day. And I think that a lot of it had to do with me actually having to hit putts solid that day and being just not stroking the ball well that day. So I just think that this is a, it's just such a, it, it, it's such an easy way to bring, we're always trying to bring skill gap together. This is a great way to bring skill gap together. PJ, I'm going to run slightly on the opposite. I, I'm going to push back in that I do not think speed in and of itself is the culprit. A small green that's super fast, yes, you can't do something interesting with it, but big greens can be fast. The, 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 the point I want to push back on, Garrett and Andy, is being short-sided has to be a penalty. Like If, it, if the greens are really slow, therefore short-siding yourself, you can still chip it really close. That's not going to lead to the best test. So I don't think speed is actually the culprit. I think, Garrett, some of what you're mentioning with the lack of interesting or strategic intrigue to the greens is the true culprit. And yes, speed, when you have small greens and you crank them up to 14, they can't be interesting. I'm with you on that. But I, I'm going to stand up a little bit for fast greens in certain instances, like at Augusta. I think candidate LaMagna is too obsessed with what goes on in pro golf. That's, well, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Short siding got... has to be a penalty kind of thing. You can, this is a you pro can golf short take. Si yes. You can say poor, yeah, what if you we can have say short siding reform? is you can say short siding yourself should be can be it can be a penalty due to architectural factors too, right? Yes, if you yes. have slower grains and can actually build some tilt into that. That's them and, the key. Yes. And pin them on the tilt then then you have kind of the same I'm with effect. you on that. Okay, fine. We're we're agreeing now. Jesus, I was trying to get some controversy going. Yeah. We need somebody to come in here and say, "I'm going to get rid of all the woke greens." That's we should have brought in a uh, party that was going to be diametrically opposed to the to the others. I think uh, <laughs> I think one, one of the main, one of the main exponents of that philosophy has disappeared from from the internet. So uh, <laughs> weren't weren't able to weren't able to manage it this time. Well, he, the, their identity could not, not be confirmed or <laughs> denied either. So, um, all right, PJ, who's who's your vote? Who's your vote for for winner? PJ is going to have to sign it. Yeah, <laughs> do it in American Sign Language. That does it for this debate. Doesn't? <laughs> I don't think he wants to make a, a vote. He's, He's not afraid choosing. of the repercussions. <laughs> So okay. the, for those who can't hear, I think we'll, that was we'll silence as in. far as the listener is concerned, yeah. right? We we'll, heard we'll from PJ, but in. you didn't. Yeah. PJ enjoyed how cutthroat Garrett was with <laughs> with his his policies, including, you know, eliminating tournaments 
So typical is, Gen Z just wants to burn it all down. Yeah. You know, doesn't doesn't recognize the value of institutions. So so Garrett has won this presidential debate. Um, that does it. I hope everybody enjoyed this lighthearted discussion. Um, <laughs> I think there are some substantial ideas in it as well. Yeah. So, all right. I, uh, let's kick it over to Rue McDonald uh, to talk about cool links. All right. Before we get to Rue McDonald and cool links, let's talk about our partner Stripe. Uh, Stripe and us have worked together for a really long time. They are one of our first uh, business products that we used. They've helped us really collect money for years and they've never given us a headache. Um, The great thing about Stripe, the impressive thing about Stripe is that they can work for us, a tiny business at the time we installed Stripe uh, into our website that allowed us to accept payments. It can work for us. It also works for massive, massive companies such as Alaska Airlines, Hertz, uh, Postmates. I mean, Postmates, you talk about Postmates, they're making, they're probably up millions of transactions a day. Toyota, Zoom. Um, so they, they work with so many companies and they have so many different products. Like one of the great things about their product is they accept tons of payment methods, which helps reduce like the amount of abandoned carts you have. Um, they also have a billing uh, product that works uh, if you have like complex billing, if it's usage based billing, um, a subscription, for example, we use it for a subscription. Uh, it works really, really well. So uh, I would, if you were going to want to check out Stripe, if you want to use Stripe, if you want to learn more about Stripe, go to stripe.com. Thanks to Stripe. Now back to Rue McDonald and Cool Links. All right, Rue. Uh, I'm excited to talk about Cool Links. Um, this is a development in northern Scotland, uh, the Highlands. Um, tell us a little bit about the history of Cool Links. Um, the land, you know, kind of how it's come to be as this somewhat, I, I don't know if this is the right word, but embroiled uh, topic in, in Northern Scotland. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And unfortunately, it has become kind of a long saga. As I'm sure we're going to discuss, a lot of Scotland's coastline is heavily protected. And this is probably one of the last genuine, incredible sites on uh, in Scotland that could be developed for Scottish golf. I think the future of Scottish links golf and, and developments uh, into Scotland will be purchasing existing golf courses, but this would be a new golf course just two miles north of Dornoch. Uh, honestly, an incredible site. And I, before I joined the, the DP World Tour where I've been working for seven and a half years, I ran my own podcast. It was a, a Scottish golf podcast. It was all about you know, speaking to people that have been on golf trips to Scotland, planning the next golf trip. And it was just a blog, really, and a podcast. And I went on the site of Cool Links and I walked the site and I actually walked into, literally walked into Mike Kaiser and at the time, you know, his right-hand man in Scotland, uh, Todd Warnock. That was the first uh, development uh, application for the golf course. Um, Todd Warnock's an American I think he's actually from Chicago and a successful businessman who loves Dornock and who has this incredible hotel in Dornock. And between the two of them, they were planning to build a golf course and have Bill Coor and Ben Crenshaw design the golf course. And I think, you know, for every, for all that Todd does for the community, he's very philanthropic. He puts a lot of money back into the town and developing things there. And um, for whatever reason, the, the locals didn't take to a mo- another American coming into Dornock and, and trying to do something. And that, uh, a lot of pushback, it went through the courts and the courts, you know, despite public opinion being in favor of the golf course and the local council approving the application, it was eventually rejected on environmental grounds. Um, so that's the short answer. That's where we are. There's There's been a new project. Uh, locals came together they, they didn't want to turn away the opportunity to have a golf course there so the locals got together communities for cool and six local people and uh, business people people that worked around uh, dora got together 
and they resurrected the project very much as a public, a uh, local, a local project. Still going to be backed by Mike Kaiser, but you know, with very much the community at, at, in the spirit of of resurrecting it, and they've got really the the first thing they did was put it to the local vote, and um, they asked locals, "Do you want a golf course?" and over almost seventy percent of them voted in favor of a golf course. So they've they've got the application re resubmitted. It passed planning. Uh, it, it got the support of the local community, but unfortunately, there's still some concerns around the environmental impact, which is it's very small. We can go into it, and it's going to be decided in a couple of weeks now in in Scotland, uh, sort of in the capital, Edinburgh, where the the national government will decide if the economic and social benefits of the golf course outweigh the the minor environmental impact. Long answer to a very uh, difficult subject matter. What um, what advantage uh, I guess was presented by the locals presenting this rather than another wealthy American? I I think you know there's there's literally a phrase. I mean, if you look into Scottish history, there's a phrase about um, you know the Highland clearances and. You've been to Scotland. You've been into sort of urban areas in the in the central belt. We call it Edinburgh and Glasgow, where the population resides. The Highlands is barren. The Highlands lacks job opportunities. If you have a young family, it's very hard to sort of find work there that can raise a young family. So a lot of locals leave Dornoch and leave the Highlands and and move down to the south where the where the population is. And the strongest argument was. You know, do we want to we want to keep population high in this part of the world, or do you want to increase numbers? It was uh, the the most recent census saw an uptake in um, older people like moving to the Highlands as a retirement sort of thing as well. So that's the biggest thing. Like you know, you know the power. We all know the power of golf uh, tourism and and the money it brings. And how do you retain you know the population? How do you keep people in the area? And tourism in the Highlands of Scotland is a massive thing and. Golf tourism's very, um, you know, a very affluent sector to be working in. So, uh, Royal Dornoch, you know, they have seventeen hundred overseas members at Royal Dornoch. They do, you know, twenty thousand visit around. So there's there's already appetite in the area for great golf, great links golf. Um, what cool can be is, you know, visitor only um, addition to that and. Uh, Anyone listening to this podcast knows about Bill Coor and Mike Kaiser and the golf courses they get involved with. It's very difficult to maybe portray that to people that are not wanting to educate themselves. And the frustrating thing for me and the and the people involved in this project is the sort of lazy uh, argument from the other side who just perceive golf to be one thing. And we know that you know modern golf course design is is. It's with minimal uh, minimal impact on the environment and trying to be as certainly Bill Coor. I mean, you know this more than me, Andy. But you know, talk to his golf course philosophy and how how little earth movement there is, and and with the environmental constraints here, this will be a this is well, this could arguably be the most natural links golf course built certainly in this century. Yeah, I think obviously, and I think there's been some projects in in Scotland that probably have. Have not been the be- the best environmental stewards over the last couple of decades, and that could potentially be some of the the backlash. Um, you know, Bill Coors obviously, you know, over his career been pretty sensitive to the environment, and uh, in in terms of you know searching out and seeking out to a tireless degree the most natural routing that he can find. Um, obviously, like Sand Hills is a great example where they really only moved earth to build one green on, on the entire site. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of, of Scotland, what do you think uh, cool links would do to elevate the general area, the Highlands, um, as you spoke about, you know, in terms of economic impact, a, it's an area where most of the people that live there move away um, to work somewhere else. And then it sounds like come back to it later in life when they are done working what type of um impact would cool links have to the to to the highlands as a as a golf tourism market yeah and it's such an important uh question in this whole argument i think i you know this is not a jibe at you but the you know the americans perceive 
the Highlands to be, you know, everything from Aberdeen to Dornoch. And it's such a long area. Like if I was to drive from Aberdeen to Dornoch, it's going to take me three and a half hours on some interesting roads. And when I met Mike Kaiser and Todd Warwick that day, and I was invited in to have a drink with them and discuss the project, I actually asked Mike Kaiser, as, as somebody who loves Scottish golf tourism, is, is you know, are your successful resorts at, at Bannon Dunes good for Scottish golf tourism or is it taking people away? Are you going to Bannon Dunes and, you know, thinking about, you know, having your golf fix? And, you know, his answer is very much like if people play Bannon Dunes, they'll be inspired to come to Scotland. Um, it's almost like a flavour of it. And he, he told me that day that, when he when he thought about creating Bannon Dunes, he he thinks of his time at Dornoch and the busloads of people arriving there and then leaving, and that is unfortunately the scenario that that Dornoch faces. People drive in these mini buses, and I I heard today people that <laughs> nobody's taking a self drive shift stick now in 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 Scotland, despite the you know the rumours. And ninety five percent of some of these golf travel agents are are sending people on golf uh, buses and being driven around the country. Uh, but that's another point. Um, unfortunately, uh, Dornick's like a a day a day visit, and it genuinely means people show up there in the morning, play their golf, which is one of the best golf courses in the world. And I'm sure one day we can enjoy that privilege together, Andy. But they they then get on the bus and they they drive off. They drive off to 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 Inverness, perhaps. You know, Cabot Highlands, which is um, you know formerly Castle Stewart, is one of my favorite places, and it's great. But it's a long way away; it's over an hour's drive uh, from Dornoch, and the the economic impact of the golfer isn't really felt in the town. And Dornoch's one of these great towns. You've we were we were lucky enough to be at the uh, the Open in St Andrews in twenty twenty two, and you get a sense of what a great golf town is. You were obviously recently in. North Berwick and Gullin and they're great golf towns and Dornock's another one and uh, I would really you know I really believe that the an addition to uh, to that area of another top 100 links golf course in the world would turn that into a destination really and unfortunately those people that, that get to Dornock at the moment and get off the bus and back on the bus don't make time to go visit Brora and Brora is famous for having the livestock roam the course and the Highland cows and the sheep that maintain the fairway, just like golf used to be in, in the 1900s. And it's one of the best golf experiences anyone can experience. And a lot of Americans don't experience it. And they, you know, they're visiting Dornock and it's only 35, 40 minutes away. So that, that is the impact that an additional golf course could have. It really would transform the area into a destination. I mean, I think that's the thing is, is you just think of the logistics of a golf trip, right? And if you get to an area and, you know, you're building your golf trip and there are two, two courses right there to play, you are, you are most likely going to stay overnight. Um, and I think the addition of a, of a cool links would do that for Dornick, especially like the way these things go, I, I have heard very few. And I think like maybe this should be considered more often when people go to Scotland is like playing a golf course a second time. It's like usually when you start to figure it out and, and learn a lot about it. But it's hard to like pass up the opportunity of seeing six or seven uh, to see three or four if you played, you know, two every time, every one twice. And I think like the other aspect of this is like getting one tee time at Royal Dornick is tough enough. Um, getting two doesn't, you know, that doesn't work for the um, economics of the town when you can only get one uh, tea time, right? Like there's there's more at play than just, you know, hey, people just aren't staying. It's like they don't have a reason to stay. And that cool links would give them an additional reason to stay um, and, and and potentially, you know, really transform an area that that is. From what I understand, I haven't been uh, one of the most you know beautiful areas in the, in the world. Um, as you said, Brewers there, Golspies there. You know there are um, there is enough good golf there, and I think like one of the things that in addition of a, of a real you know like I, I think like you know there's there's great courses that people know about like you know an Ely um, a but like there are there are courses that that draw a greater interest and, and, you know, the Kaiser, um, name along with Bill core 
has the opportunity to pull in a greater appeal to an area. And then all of a sudden you look at Golspi, Cool Links, Brora, and Dornick, and it becomes a potential two, three night stay. Yeah. And I think that's the frustrating thing. Like we know golf, right? Um, and we are, you know, part of the 1% that, you know, consume your content and, and love that. But you, you do have a, a great, a perfect recipe in Mike Kaiser, Bill Coor, Dornick, Scottish Highlands, Lynx Golf. Like it's a perfect cocktail. And unfortunately, the opposition and the people that have been clever on the opposition, you know, they've just labeled it golf. And I, I do believe that if you did, you know, 10 minutes of research about Mike Kaiser, 10 minutes about Bill Coor, you realize that these people care deeply for the environment. They they build golf courses with golf and great golf at the forefront. They don't build any of the other BS that goes around it. They they care for great you know great golf sandy soils like that is their that's their footprint right and you know this more than me and you've been lucky to be in Bill Coors company like that guy deserves you know deserve you know in the grand scheme of things it's not a big deal but like his legacy would would be fitting to have a great links golf course in Scotland. Um, which you you think time is running out, you know, there's not many sites left and there's not many opportunities left. And, you know, by all accounts, his routing is really exciting. It's very natural. It's conducive to the environment. I mean, the the environmental impact of the golf course is going to be less than 1% of the triple SI. Um, it's really going to be greens and tee boxes that are going to be maintained. And, and um, you know, even, even, um, you know, landing areas maybe being preserved by sheep initially just kind of help mitigate the 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 footprint and the damage done to the environmental areas. But um, I really don't think people understand like who you're dealing with here in terms of people that care for the environment. And I said this to you before we recorded, like golfers do love the environment. Like I love being outdoors, like you love being outdoors. It's very much part of the experience and the days of golfers not being that way. I mean, I think I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that in terms of like, you know, I, I, I think more and more golfers are enjoying, enjoying taking care of nature and, and I feel obligated to enjoy the environment a bit more. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's one of the, I think it, it is probably with a lot of golfers a little bit more subliminal than upfront, but like to me, like one of the most beautiful, one of the things that I love most about golf, like there's, Nothing I love more than a, a a twilight round playing golf. Really, I I love playing by myself a twilight round and just being alone in nature. Like, and I think like the golf courses that I personally am kind of drawn to when I think about it um, are often the ones that that blend in with nature the most. You know, and are are really that embody kind of the natural um, features that you would have encountered if you were just hiking the the golf course and i think like that's you know from all signs with this project what's interesting is it's almost a constraint where they have to be so environmentally um sensitive with their with the the creation of the golf course that it could yield you know one of the most natural golf courses built in the modern era which is a fascinating, you know, subject matter, right? Like the idea of like building a golf course without disturbing the environment. And I think there's been some, some, um, uh, credit to golf actually being a, a wonderful way to stabilize dunes and, and to preserve dunes because there's a aspect of the golf course that has inherent benefit and interest in pr- preservation of the dunes land that that these golf courses sit in yeah and that's a huge part of the argument here as well i mean one person i haven't mentioned yet is chris haspel who would be the course manager who helped build castle stewart with gil hans um who's built golf courses in in scandinavia and across europe you know being environmentally conscious this is a guy like mike and uh, like bill build things um shape things don't don't build things they, they do things very minimally but yeah i mean um the current site as well despite it being you know classed as a a triple si like the highest rating that you could have on a site it's very poorly maintained the the scottish government uh, that managed this nature scott they have dwindling budgets you know i know for a fact my father used to work for nature scott uh weirdly enough 
And the budget that the Scottish government set aside to preserve sites like this have reduced and reduced and reduced to a point where the Scottish government are now encouraging private investment. And part of Cool Links' initiative here is to invest money into maintaining this site and getting rid of evasive species. I know Americans love gorse, but it's an evasive species. It overtakes the lynx. Um, there's there's trees on the site. There's uh, other evasive species. And it's fallen into disrepair because nobody's put any proper money into it. And the, the Cool Links plan has you know, investment into that. It has investment into public walking paths. The great thing about Scotland, as you know, Andy, and having been the here right a to Rome. Now, the right to roam everywhere I is love that. public. And and this this is it. Like it's not gonna be a gated community. This is they've got a beautiful beach as it is. You can go on any beach in Scotland and it's public and they, they're encouraging that. They're encouraging wildflowers and all that to thrive. So if if it gets approved that there's a hearing in a couple of weeks time, it has the potential to be special. It has a potential to be inclusive, and that's what I love about Scotland is how inclusive Scottish golf is. And um, yeah, here's hoping because we know the people involved, you know, care deeply. And you know, Bill Kerr, I think uh, I you've spoken to him. I've actually watched your content and, and Bill talking about this. Bill looks for these landmarks on the site and figures out ways to play around it and and not interfere with it. I mean, make them. Make them part of the the player experience, but don't ruin them. That they're 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 interested in subject matters, and I don't think the opposition and people that look at golf negatively understand that kind of philosophy, which is super frustrating. Yeah, yeah. I um, what in terms of uh, if if this passes, what would be the potential timeline for uh, playing golf there? I, I think it's quite quite quick. I mean, Chris Haspel would be the guy who we need to answer. But I mean, the plans are there. Um, the growing period in Scotland is, you know, that's difficult, and we're seeing that with some other projects. Um, you know, I I know that you're you know you're quite close to things at Cabot Highlands, and we have a short growing window in Scotland, so that would be a factor. But I think there's no there there's not a great deal of work to be done. You're not moving. You know, you're not moving thousands of tons of material. It, as we say, it's going to be a very natural golf course. So, I think you'd be looking at sort of two, two and a half years, sort of from now, where you could look at getting something. And you know, I'm not too intimately aware of the the Kaiser model in terms of you know the the, the memberships that they hand out and these playing experiences that you can have. But um, I don't see why it wouldn't be you know quite a short period really um given that we have a short growing season but the the actual build and again you're far more educated in, in what goes into building golf courses and the timelines but um you know with with nature kind of not being interrupted too much i don't see why it would take too long um another thing to add there is is also the fact that you know we mentioned these other golf courses two that we didn't mention were ski bow um which is kind of a, a links course there it's a little bit, it's sort of limited play, but it's it's a Lynx course, beautiful setting. The home of Mad- Madonna's um, famous marriage to Guy Ritchie. Um, but that's not that, put that um, put you off. Um, and then the, the news last week that Dornock's second golf course, the Struy, is going under some significant um, course improvements. So a lot of people don't realize that Dornock's got a second golf course, but they do. It's not on the greatest pieces of land, uh, but they've purchased new land and they have plans to improve that golf course. So um, I can't tell you how, how much you know investment and an opportunity there is here in Scotland. I, I don't think there's ever been greater demand for people to come to Scotland. And, and that's another case in this argument is to say, well, does Scotland need another golf course? That's the opposition saying that. And again, me and you know that you know it's not any golf course it's a bill coor mike kaiser golf course and um, and it's a links course on incredible land and i think dunbarney here in in um, in st andrews you know opened up three years ago um part of the true golf portfolio and they're already seeing like huge numbers of golfers and they've only been open three years so mm-hmm. there's a huge demand for golf travel as, as you know andy and um I, I don't see any scenario where this doesn't become an overnight success Seems like everywhere is sold out. So it's, uh, you know, I think, I think like the big thing is it's probably the portion of Scotland that's the least traffic, the least discovered. And it's a, you know, it even opens up, it presents an opportunity for a reason for a trip if Dornick isn't part of your itinerary. 
um, which is, you know, I think that that's the thing that, you know, I, you know, C- Castle Stewart or Cabot Highlands is going to attract a lot more uh, visitors than in the future or than in the past. And getting people to just venture a little bit further north would be would be a huge win for the the greater area. So uh, we will follow this this story as it uh, as it happens. Uh, Rue, thank you for coming on and uh, and and giving us the insights into what's going on with Cool Links. Cheers, Annie. Thanks. Today's podcast was edited and produced by PJ Clark. PJ, big thanks. He's he's off to Phoenix this week to see the Schwab Cup. It's going to be fun. Thank you guys for listening. We'll be back later this week with... Uh, I think we're into a new, another golf architecture focused uh, podcast. So we'll be back later this week and uh, talk to you soon.